we turned, man, and went into prayer, y'all, and he led us to the scripture in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm going to read it, and um, we're going to pick up where we stopped off. And um, we was more in um, a teaching message, and um, I'm going to kind of talk with you, but let me go ahead on and read the text. The Bible is saying, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore I exalt, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. God bless your word in Jesus' name. So, y'all, we've we, we, we been going through this text, man, and we started, y'all, we was dealing with, we end up talking about Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The scripture that tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And uh, we got into um, this text, just breaking it down, and we went over that, that we wrestle not. We wrestle not. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And we broke that down to the, to, to the T, I, I believe, by the grace of the Most High, because we know that, that, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we broke it down and we went through why it always seemed like. Because we got to be real with ourselves. Though we know what God say, as we live our life, it seems like it's different. It seems like we wrestling against people, even people that's close to us. So we broke it down and gave the analogy, man. And the reason it seemed like that is because in this warfare, people are intertwined in it intertwining it and we got to deal with this 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 warfare without hurting people without dealing with the people that's intertwined in it we told you it's like a person being intertwined in a net yo but yet you trying to cut the net you trying to deal with the rope they intertwine in a rope but you trying to do it without cutting the person and that's not easy yo that's not easy, but we talked about the brilliance of God and how he gave us spiritual weapons, y'all, to be able to deal with this spiritual warfare. Because a lot of times we have trouble because we're dealing with it with natural means. When God gave us spiritual weapons, ooh, he said, he said, he said, he said, our weapons of warfare are what? Not carnal, but spiritual. Ooh, you know what I'm saying? Mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, yo. And we went deep into that, man. And I be getting caught up on these, these recaps, y'all, because it make me want to preach, man. <laughs> it make me want to preach it again. So we going to just pick up where we left off. And uh, sound boot, I'm going to need you, Tim, man. We going to pick up. With the scripture, and, uh, we, t we, we left off, y'all, talking about, because we went into this text. Mm. We went into the book of the Ascension of Isaiah, y'all. The Ascension of Isaiah, and a lot might not be up to date with that book. So we went into that book, and what it is, is a, it's an it's a, it's a extra biblical book. We don't quite call it the canon, y'all, because, you know what I'm saying, God, I believe, and um, just through studying, God don't lose nothing. And men could do nothing outside of God. <laughs> so they had the Council of Nicaea, you heard about it, and they picked certain books, the Catholic religion, y'all, and they put together the 66 book, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes we could get caught up thinking they took out or they did this or they did that. Nah, God is stronger. Than any man. God is stronger than any devil. So nothing could be removed or taken out without him allowing it. So we dive into this book, and this book is a pseudopigrapher book, y'all. We talked about the, 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 um, the, the apocrypha books as well. You got the apocrypha writings, and then you got the pseudopigrapher writings. And we went deep into that. I don't have time to go back, but, um, the sermon going to probably be putting up, but um, I just wanted to show you that. And then we dealt with it, and we came back and gave you all kind of 
um, credibility of the book. Credibility. We give you credibility of it just looking at it and, 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 and breaking it down on where the book come from. And we told you that it was a book that came, the, the ascension of Isaiah, it came from the, the Ethiopians, y'all. And they were Ethiopian Christians. And that's what we're going to kind of go deep into tonight and break that down, you know what I'm saying? They was Ethiopian Christians, y'all. And we talked about it, that it was a manuscript put together, you know what I'm saying? By the Ethiopians, a whole text, y'all, put together by the Ethiopian. And um, I'm going to just kind of read it. Tim, you could pull up that first pic while I talk, while I um, talk about it. And then we're going to kind of go in about it, y'all. And um, I'm going to let you follow me on that, man. So y'all just follow me, be Bereans. We kind of going into the history right quick, you know, but... um. It's what he want to talk about, yo. <laughs> it's what he want to talk about, you know, and who am I to talk about what I want to talk about and not what he want to talk about. So this is going to be more of a, um, a teaching message, y'all, just, just going deep into um, a little history for a moment. And sometimes we need that, y'all. Everything can't be about preaching. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we got to teach. We got to teach. And um, this ascension of Isaiah, just to give you a little information, it's an extensive text compromising 11 chapters and 269 verses. You know what I'm saying? And it's, um, it's not known exactly who wrote the book, y'all. And it was written and produced in the late 1st century, the 2nd century, and some would even say the 3rd and 4th century, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And these are all in the times of what they call A.D., after dominion, after Christ's dominion. You know what I'm saying? And then they say after his dominion. He still got dominion. Glory to God. But they also say it's C.E., meaning Christ's era or Christian era, the time where Christians was in play. Because before Christ, y'all, you got to understand, there was no Christian. It was only this Hebrew faith following what? The Torah, the Pentateuch, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But Christ came through and started a whole new faith called the New Testament, called what, y'all? Christian. And I love Christians, and I know our Hebrew brothers don't like that word, y'all, but when you go back and study it, all it means is followers of Christ. And the word Christ, is the, in the Hebrew, it means Messiah. You know what I'm saying? So don't get caught up with wordplay. You know what I'm saying? All Christians mean is a follower of Christ. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians, it tells us in the, the writings of Paul that, that, that they was first called Christians where? At Antioch. At Antioch. So don't get caught up into that. You know what I'm saying? And um, it, was, it was Christian Ethiopians who put together this book. And we gave you charts, we broke down graphs, and we showed you that it was Hebrews who wrote it. You know what I'm saying? And we broke down the definition of, of um, pseudepigrapha, I ain't got time to go into it, and the apocrypha writing. And we let you know that it's commentary. And if you could read commentary from John MacArthur, if you could read commentary from Wayne Brudem. If you could read commentary from Tony Evans and all these other giants in the faith, y'all, you should be able to read commentary from men that lived it out and walked in your Bible. <laughs> and our pastor is doing an awesome job breaking down the book of Jasher right now, y'all. The book of Jasher. So we gonna introduce you to these books. Don't think it's strange. Take these books, read these books, and, and line it up with your Bible. Because it's going to give you commentary. It's going to give you understanding of the Bible that you never had. That you never had before. It's going to open your eyes. And we're living in an age of truth, y'all. The Bible said, know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the age we live in. It. Whether you know it or not, that's the age we live in. It. It's an age of exposure, y'all. 
I told you last time, church cannot continue going the way it's going. The people ready for me, y'all, and not just milk. God is doing a new thing. He's ready to reveal ooh, his people again. He's ready to raise up his people again. He's ready, y'all, to deal with this Babylon system. And he's going to use you, woman of God. He's going to use you, man of God. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to be that, 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 that tool in his hand to bring the church back. He's going to call by the rock, he said in the scripture. And he's going to smash the Babylon kingdom. And we're going to be a part of that. We're going to be a part of that by the grace of the Most High. You know what I'm saying? So, man, this, these books going to bless you. And um, this ascension of Isaiah, y'all, it was unknown, but it was written by Hebrews. And we talked about it, how it talked about the martyrdom of Isaiah. How Isaiah died, it gives you all the facts. And theologians know this. Your top, your top scholars know this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yet they tell us don't read these books. <laughs> because they kind of hide things. And it's not even really them. It's the spirit ooh, that's working in the world. The anti-spirit. Anti-Christ. You know what I'm saying? He had blinded the world, yo. He had blinded the world, but we hit by the grace of God to remove the blindness. And it was a manuscript, y'all, that was put together as a whole text, one single text, and there was no other than the Ethiopians who put it together. So we got we to gotta deal with that. We can't just run over that. We can't just leave that. You know what I'm saying? And as I'm studying this, I see why. And you're going to see why. And we're going to get into some scriptures. We're going to do some preaching. We're going to close it out. Huh, what? She had to help me with this, y'all. <laughs> By the grace of the most high. You know what I'm saying? And it's found in other translations, but only in the, 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 the Ethiopian manuscripts we find one text. And it's in the Ethiopian Bible. It's concluded in the Ethiopian Bible, y'all. And all these other books are as well. And we broke it down last time. I don't have time. But sound boot follow me, man. Let's go into um. I'm gonna call up, man, to the stand, a guy by the name of David Daniel the third. I sent you a uh, clip, sound boot. David Daniel the third. And um, just to give you a little credibility, all right, he sent the pics first. Uh, give me, give me, give me the other pics. Um, sound booth, keep going. We gonna we gonna work with that. That's cool. Um, go go the um go the other way. Go the other way from me. You got any more? We gonna come back to them. So, um, go again, go again. We're going to get at that. Go again. Give me another one. Y'all work with us, y'all. You can stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Thank you, Lord. We're going to work with it, y'all. But um, matter of fact, go one more because I want them to see this guy where they could go and study it for themselves. Go one more. Give me um, David D. Daniel. One more sound boot. Come on, Daddy. Work with us. In Jesus. Well, his name, y'all, if y'all can write it down, is David D. Daniels the third. And um, he joined the faculty of, of McCormack, um, McCormack Theology Seminary in 1987, y'all. And he was inaugurated as a professor of church history in 2003 2003 go back sambu let me get that pick again and um this guy y'all been doing a study and um he not even trying to be deep he don't even really understand hebrew doctrine he ain't trying to deal with the hebrews or none of that but sometimes when you're studying 
You're going to run across things that God going to give you. And I'm going to give it to you. And then I'm going to share a revelation with you that he's given me to bring all the pieces together. So you could get to understand. That's what the scripture say. The scripture say, unless the people get a revelation, they cast off restraint. They cast off restraint. So we're here to give you revelation. So this guy, Daniel, y'all, he's doing a study of the Ethiopian Christian. And his point is to show that Africans, Africans, black Americans, Africans, black Africans, I mean that, you know, black Africans, so-called Americans, he, he trying to show the contribution that they played in um, Christianity, they call it. I like to just call it Christians, you know what I'm saying? But Christianity, and he's breaking it down on the contribution that they played in. The contribution that they they, they um, played a major hand in, y'all. And um, they break it down. Hold up, I'm looking for a little paper that I had. Yeah, but they break it down, y'all. And um, Dr. Daniels do an awesome job with this. I don't have this shit. Oh, there it go. Thank you, Lord. He do an awesome job with this, y'all. And he breaks this study down and he proves, he proves, y'all, that, that, that Africans had a hand in Christianity. Because a lot of our people, we go astray because we think this Christian faith started in the West, y'all. We think it started with the European. But we don't understand that it was the Eastern religion. A religion that was burnt not in the West, but in the East. It was burnt in Africa. It was burnt in Northern East Africa, to be exact. They call it nowadays what? The Middle East, y'all. It was never a Middle East. It was never a Middle East. And, and this guy is breaking this down, showing the, the, the credibility of, of, of Africans being a part being a hand in the Christian faith. And we're going to see it going even deeper, being a hand in the Reformation. <laughs> Starting the Protestant movement, y'all. Y'all don't know how deep this is. Y'all don't know how deep this is. Starting the Protestant movement. You see, you see the Catholics had all religion bound. I told you about that, how Satan snuck in, you know what I'm saying, and, and took hold, strong on the Catholic church, yo, to abuse God's people. And we broke it down. We showed you who is this empire, this spirit behind this empire, wrong. no other than Satan himself. <laughs> Some call him Balaam in the book of the Ascension of Isaiah. Some call him Simjaza in these other biblical books. We know him as Satan. We know him as the devil. We know him, you know what I'm saying, as Abaddon. You know what I'm saying? But this, this, this religion had everything bound. But God had a word. He said he always called his people out of her. And he used Martin Luther. We're going to get into it. He used Martin Luther in a major way, y'all putting them 99 theses on the door to bring God's people out of false religion. But the thing that they don't tell us that they hide from us is that Hebrew Christians had a hand in it. <laughs> We're going to dive into a guy by the name of Michael the Deacon. Michael the Deacon. <laughs> Michael the Deacon. You know, and we're going to look at this, man, and, and it's going to bless us because I got a word for our Hebrew brothers out of this. I got a word for us as a people because I believe God showed through this and we're going to go through it. God showed how he would keep those that follow him. Mm, we're going to look at the scripture in, Ma in Malachi. He said, I'm going to make a difference from them that worship me right, Miss Terry. Them that's, that's connected to me. Oh, God, them that's mine, he said, from those that's not. He said, I'm going to make a difference. 
I'm going to make a difference. And our people don't understand the difference. Ooh. You see, if you don't get under Christ, you're going to be a hot Hebrew in hell. You know what I'm saying? So I'm here to bring this to you to show you the difference. And to, and to make you change your word, ways because I believe God going to blow upon them and use them because he's been using them even in the era of getting this thing out to the world. <laughs> Standing on the street corners, not understanding they doing it, trying to work out their own righteousness, Paul. It, not, not submitting to the righteousness of God, but God's still using it. <laughs> God's still using it. But we want to show Show how God could, he, he always keep them that's here. You know what I'm saying? Because as it happened in, in 70 AD, we're going to look at, and we're going to look at it, you know what I'm saying? But Psalm Boot, let's, let's get back into it by the grace of God. Help me, Lord. You know I like to preach too much. <laughs> Be with me, Dad. Let me teach this thing. And Jesus. Well, this guy, y'all, David, um, David D. Daniels, man, he did a, a deep study on it. And um, he found out that Michael the deacon was a part of the Reformation. He was a part of this Christian movement that went to the West. And we know it was always God's desire for it to go to the West when we read in the book of Romans. God promised that it would go to the Gentiles. He said, we fell that they might receive what? The gospel. Our diminishing was for what? Their riches. He said, but how much more I will restore? So it was all a part of God's plan, y'all. But um, he breaks it down, and we're going to look at a letter, y'all. A letter that was wrote by uh, Melanch M uh, a guy named Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon. Thank you, Lord. Philip Melanchthon, we're going to look at this letter, and it's a letter that writes about a conversation, a theological conversation that took place between Michael the deacon and Martin Luther. Ooh, God. God, deep, y'all. Deep. And um, he breaks his study down, and you could go back and check it out, man. All this is factual. He talks about four guys, y'all, that did a, a deep study on Martin Luther. And if you're older in the faith, you would probably know these guys, but they did all the study on Martin Luther, all his writings, all his 52 um, writings and everything <laughs> that, they, that they, they give, you know what I'm saying, starting the Lutheran church. And um, he said all these guys, through all they study they did, y'all, they never mentioned Michael the Deacon. You only could find this letter that we're going to read in their days, in their days. Now, now we coming into a new age. God is bringing, raising up, <laughs> he raising up different hearts, Miss Tara. You know what I'm saying? So we able to get information that we wouldn't be able to get back then. But this letter that we're going to look at, it was only written in Latin and in German. In Latin and in German. So who could read that? We can't understand that. You know what I'm saying? So how would we be able to get this information? And this guy said, for whatever reason, it wasn't written. And um, it was guys like Martin Bratchett. He was a German church historian, yo. People like George Fawcett. You know what I'm saying? He was an ordained pastor of the Lutheran church in Hungary, yo. In a place called Hungary. But also Tom G.A. Harden. He was an author and a pastor of St. Martin Luther Church in Sweden. In Sweden, y'all. And um, Mark um, Ellerstein, Ellen, something like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he was also a Lutheran pastor, professor in um, the Church of History um, of, theology, of, the, of the Theology Center in Atlanta, y'all. And he about 75 year old right now, you know what I'm saying? But in none of their writings do they bring up this guy called Michael the Deacon from Ethiopia. From Ethiopia. They don't bring him up, y'all, for some reason. And um, we're going to get into um, 
some scriptures I should have given to you before, but God had ho- always had a connection. I might as well give you that before. God had, had ho- always had a connection. Sound boot, I need you to come back to that, to that, um, that pick, man, for the for the um four bold claims that that yeah, right there. Stay right there that for me. Thank you, Lord. But I want to read you this in um the scriptures right quick. And um, these are scriptures I want you to write down because you wouldn't you wouldn't hear last time when we talked about it last Thursday. So I gotta give you this to make the correlation. But um there's a scripture in um in Psalm 68:31. Sound boot. Let me get that right quick. 68:31. And then we're gonna go through these pictures. Y'all work with us, man. We we getting things right, you know what I'm saying? By the grace of the most high. But it's in Psalms 68, 31, y'all. And um, God prophesied in um, the book of Psalms, y'all. In the scripture, it says, princes shall come out of Egypt. Princes shall come out of Egypt. And that prince can also be involved. It can also be an ambassador. It can also be president, y'all. Like President Nasser, who was a president over e- um, Egypt, y'all. But also, he says, that Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hand unto God. Unto God. She going to soon stretch out her hand unto God. She going to seek God, yo. And we know the correlation of of, um, Ethiopia even going back to Queen Sheba, who sought the wisdom of Solomon, Jesus talked about. You know what I'm saying? So, So the hand of God was always favoring Ethiopia. We even talked about even going back when you go to the book of um, Jasher, it talks about Moses being a king over Cush, y'all, over the land of Cush. And as you study it, some try to make crumbs out of bricks, you know what I'm saying? Make um, bricks out of crumbs. (laughs) Because when you study it, it, um, it talks about, when you look it up, it talks about the queen, um, Candace, the queen of Cush. Or Candace, like the Bible say, and we're going to look at the scripture, the queen of Ethiopia. You know what I'm saying? In this place, Cush, you know what I'm saying? It can also be broke down because it was also called Nibia. Nibia, y'all. It was called Nibia. And some going to say, oh, that's Nibia, that's not Ethiopia. But all that area was generalized and called Ethiopia. <laughs> and I was telling my wife, talking to her, it's like the neighborhood I grew up in. When I came up, we called it Cropperville. <laughs> and you're not going to really know, but just imagine a neighborhood that you might have came up in. But we call it Cropperville. And we the young bucks that came up after the older people. And, and we didn't know, we had no idea that at one time it wouldn't call Cropperville. <laughs> but it was called Greenville. So with the word play, we could think that they're talking about all kind of different, like a whole totally different person, place. But that's all in the same area. And the Bible generalizes this. Um, give me the next one in Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3.9. I got to give you this before we get into it to make the link. The Bible saying 9, verse 9. For then will I turn to the people of pure language, that they may call upon my name of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord to serve him. To serve him. Keep going, sound boot. To serve him in one consent. That one consent means to serve him in one accord. One accord. He said, I'm going to return to them one language. And I was reading it in the book of Acts, man. And I don't got time to go into it, but there's a famous scripture you know about. You know about this heavenly language that came down at Pentecost. Oh, God. When they was in one accord, one agreement, y'all, one heart, he gave them one language, y'all. Speaking in one accord. Fire fell upon them and clothes of fire. What? In tongues, y'all. And the scripture says that they spoke, y'all. 
in this heavenly language. They spoke in tongues, and it said that different people of different um, geographics was there, yo. Imagine us being in a room speaking one language, and we're going to get in touch when we deal with the um, different elements of prayer and break it down further. But we in one room on one accord with one heart, and God restored one language. Who? You see, we think that they was up there in the upper room speaking a bunch of different languages. Who? But they were speaking one language, a heavenly language, y'all. They were speaking in tongues. Uh, Paul said uh, 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 a tongue that only God can understand. Because when we speak in this unknown to tongue, we speak mysteries to God. <laughs> we speak mysteries to God, yo. You know what I'm saying? So they up there speaking in tongues in different geographics passing by. That's like we in a room and the, the window is open and we got people from Egypt passing by. We got people from Libya passing by. We got people from China passing by. We got people from Russia passing by, y'all. And they hear us speaking this heavenly language. And it's not that we speak in different languages, but every single one of them, by the grace of God, a miracle by God, they all hear it in their own native tongue. <laughs> the Chinese hear it in his tongue. The Russian hear it in his tongue. Libyan, hear it in his tongue. It's not that we speak in a multitude different language. Now, nah, God is causing their hearing to hear it in the only. That's like me speaking English to you, but they got a Chinese man in here, and God calls him to hear the English that I'm speaking to y'all in Chinese. We're going to get into that and break it down. But he gave them one language. Let me get that scripture again, sound boot. To serve him in one, one consent, in one accord. They was all on one accord, y'all. And he says, verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my, supplement, my, uh, uh, my supple, supplements, that means, he says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my people, in the other translation, my people. He said, even the daughters of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. They're going to bring my offering all the way from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Huh? And then we went to this famous scripture in Acts 8.26. Let me get it, sound boot, so we could dive in. You know the scripture where the Bible said that the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, Unto the way that goeth down. Let me get the next one. From Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Keep going, sound boo. And he rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of the authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. Of Ethiopia. And when you break that down, man, some say, that this Ethiopian wasn't no Gentile. He wasn't no African. But he was a Hebrew. <laughs> Who was raised up in Ethiopia because our people traveled. Our people was dispersed. That's why God calls them dispersed. And we're going to get in touch because we in that same place right now. <laughs> God. In a strange place. A place that's not our own. You know what I'm saying? And he did that, I believe, in this Ethiopian union. The Bible says in verse 9, For then I will restore the peoples of pure language that they, wait, they may... Oh, I'm in verse 9 until you say, verse, verse 2, keep going. Sound boot left it. I'm going to clean it up. He said, um, Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. That's the bottom um, verse of 27, y'all. He said, who had charge over of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to do what? To worship, y'all. He came to Jerusalem to worship. That's what God prophesied. He said they're going to come back and bring mine off. They're going to come back and worship, but not just worship with their songs and with their tongues, y'all, but what? 
worship what they're giving. Paul, it just brought you into a new level of worshiping. You see, when we give, when, when we give, the Bible says, honor the Lord with thy substance, y'all. We are worshiping. <laughs> it's a part of worshiping. God sees it. He sees it. Just like he's seen it even in the Gentile Cornelius. But God promised that they would come to Jerusalem to worship. He come way from Ethiopia. You know how our, uh, um, around Passover our people would make that journey back to the homeland. And that's what this Ethiopian was doing. And by sitting in his chariot, he was reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. So we made the connection. So now let's get into it, man. Don Boot, now you can pull up the pictures for me. And then I want you to go back to them bold claims. But let's pull up the pictures for them. Because our people are still in Ethiopia. They're still in Ethiopia today, but not just the Falasha Jews, not just the, just the, just the, just the Hebrews who, who only follow the Torah, but I want to show you these Christian Hebrews. Come on, sound boot. Look at that. Look at that, y'all. Look at that. A Hebrew in Ethiopia, but not just a Hebrew, but Christian Hebrew. And I bring this to you because you got to understand that the disciples were Christian Hebrew. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Every single one of them was Christian Hebrew. Give me another one, sound boot. Not only that, but they built a whole church carved out of a rock, carved out of stone, y'all. It's called the, the Lalibella. Um, Lalibella is in Lalibella. You know what I'm saying? It's a church that they built in like the, the 12th century or the 11th century, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And um, I had the text, but it talks about it. Um, and it says that, 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 that they was trying to build, because they got 11 of these things, y'all. They was trying to build Jerusalem again. <laughs> They, they got up to 11. I'm thinking they wanted to, to build 12 of them. Because you got to think about it. And we're going to get to the scripture. But let me, let me, let me finish bake this thing. But look at this. Christians in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia. And I got to go to it. Sound boot. Man. Christians in Ethiopia, y'all. You know? Christians in Ethiopia. And I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but I got to go there, man. You got to understand that Ethiopia is very special, y'all. And we're going to get into it, and you're going to see it in this letter. I don't want to move ahead of myself, but I got to tell you this. Ethiopia is very special. It's said that Ethiopia is the first Christian church Christian um, nation that was put together outside of Jerusalem. Because you got to understand that the church started in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, And John was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And you got to understand that, 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 that Jesus, he gave a word of prophecy, man. Tom Buddha, I'm going to have to go to it now. Bring me um, Luke 21, 20 and 22. We got to go to it now. We got to go to it now. But he gave a prophecy. And um, he told the people of God. Look what he said. He said, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compass with armies. You know what I'm saying? In my um, translation, it says, when you going to see sur Jerusalem surrounded by armies, yo. Then know that a desolation is near. And it also linked to the prophecy in Daniel. During the Hellenation days, when they went in, you know what I'm saying, this, this emperor, um, Nero, went in and, 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 and did desolation in our temple. A whole bloodshed. 
You know what I'm saying? But all theologians, including John MacArthur, they point this scripture, yo, to 70 AD. 70 AD when Jerusalem was encamped around about, yo. And God told his people, he said, when you see that happen, he said, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let them not let let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. May be fulfilled. Jesus told him to flee to the mountain. They flee to Africa. The mountains in Africa, they flee to Africa, because when you look at the map, Rome is coming from above them. So they would never run towards Rome. Oh, God. They would flee to Africa. They would flee into Egypt, and then they would flee into Africa. Running from the Rome. And you could go and look at Josephus and even um, Rudolf Winsor in the book of Babylon to Timbuktu. He said that a million Jews fled into Africa. And that's all true. But my question is, what happened to the Hebrew Christian. Where did they flee, Nick? Where did they go? Where did they go? Because they were Christians. They believed in Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. You know? They was Christians. Where did they flee? You know what I'm saying? And I believe a lot of them flee into Ethiopia, which was already set up a Christian nation from Ethiopian Christians who got baptized by, by Philip going back to Ethiopia, y'all. And then when you study church history, the apostle um, Matthew, y'all, Jesus' disciple, church history say he took his ministry and went to e Ethiopia. And that's where he was martyred at. He died in Ethiopia. All the, 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 the disciples were martyred, y'all. They was murdered. Just like they Lord. <laughs> so he died in Ethiopia, but he brought his faith with him. Oh, God. He brought his faith with him. And it's so special because out of all the colonizing, and we're going to look at it, out of all of the, the diaspora things that was going on, Ethiopia was never colonized. Every other place in Africa was colonized except for Ethiopia, except for Ethiopia. So, man, let's get back in it, man. Sound Booth pulled me up these, these, these bold statements by, by Daniel David, and we're going to get into this guy, Michael the deacon. But look what he says, not to digress, y'all. Well, I'm at on time, love, and we're going we gonna to stop when time is due, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But I got to give you this. Study with me. Study with me. It's going to bless you. Ooh, in the long run, it's going to bring this thing together, y'all. You know what I'm saying? His first claim was in 1534 that Martin Luther had a theological conversation with an Ethiopian clergy named Michael the Deacon. His second claim, y'all, was after this theological conversation, Martin Luther extended full communion to Michael the Deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. His third claim, within Luther's scattered mentions of Ethiopia lies, the assumed or implicted historic narrative of Ethiopia Christians that holds Ethiopia Christianity in high esteem. You know? His fourth claim was for Luther, ooh, the Church of Ethiopia was a model church or one of his dream churches. That's what Luther thought about the Ethiopian church. He said it was a model church. <laughs> he said it would be like a church of role model, y'all. He coming out of false religion, coming out of this Catholic, this Catholic bondage, y'all. And he run into Michael the deacon who's talking about by faith alone. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Talking about my faith alone. He said Ethiopia was one of his dream church. I ain't never read this, y'all. And we, and we highly esteem Martin Luther for allowing God to use him to stand up against this false church, y'all, that had God people going to hell in a handbasket, selling indulgence and all these different things. I was caught up in this Catholic church, never brought a Bible to church, y'all. Never brought a Bible to church. And this thing got majority of our people in bondage, yo. Especially in the South, you know what I'm saying? And especially in our um, Latino and, and, and Mexican people, man. This thing had been a stumbling block to us. And God prophesied it in Deuteronomy that we would be a religious people. We would serve wood and we would serve stone. You know what I'm saying? But God used Martin Luther. So now, Sambu, pull up this letter. Pull up this letter for me right quick. In this letter, y'all, it's called, you could go up and read it, um, go back and check it out. It's, um, it's called An Ethiopian Orthodox Monk in the Cradle of the Reformation. In the Cradle of the Reformation, Michael and Luther, Martin Luther in the unity of the church. And this is a letter that was put together, y'all, by, by Stan, Stan, uh, Stan, uh, Stan, 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 uh, <laughs> oh, God, that's a hard name, y'all. <laughs> Stanish, Stanish Lao, pull out. Thank you, Lord. Stanish Lao, pull out. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you for helping here, God, in Jesus' name. But let's read this thing, y'all. Um, Stanis Palau put this thing together. And um, I'm going to read some of it, and um, I'm going to stop and give revelation as I read it. So just follow with me, and we're going to conclude when we conclude, y'all, by the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? But look, it starts off by saying, y'all, this, this Protestant encounter. That's what it was about. However, it is not mere the fact of such an early encounter between the Ethiopian Orthodox monk in the German reform that it make extraordinary significance, y'all, of high importance. This thing is of high importance, y'all. I'm going to continue. It is rather, and is in high importance, he said, because um, of, his, of his theological dimensions. This inter- cultural dialogue about the, the core issues of the Christian doctrine, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, God, of the Christian doctrine, you know what I'm saying, and, um, sh and uh, re resulted in the mu mutually shared convictions that the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians and proponents of the Wittenberg Reformation, being to the very same church of Christ. And what he's saying in this, y'all, he's saying that, that they mutually share the same conviction, the same conviction. You see, I could understand the Bible saying, ooh, test the spirit by the spirit. You see, I could understand who are my brothers and sisters. Ooh, when we get in the midst of one another, our spirit going to bear the same convictions. <laughs> and I'm talking about on a general state because we all got our personal convictions. But I'm talking about on a general state. We going to share the same convictions. You see, Paulia send me something out of the blue and tell me, pastor, minister, you know what I'm saying? What you think about that? <laughs> and as I read it and break it down and I send him back my thoughts, he'd be like, ooh, we on the same page. Because same spirits, y'all. You see what I'm saying? We only got one spirit, the Bible says. One spirit, one baptism, y'all. Ooh, one God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if you operating in the spirit of the most high, 
The Bible says our spirit bear witness that we are children of God. Man. His spirit resides in us so they had the same convictions, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Bearing the fact that they was of the same church. Because, because the Catholics had a whole different conviction. <laughs> had a whole different conviction, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He said this, contribu this contribution was a twofold objective. Firstly, it aims to construct the circumstance, the uh, circumstances and the main content of the theological dialogue between Michael and the Wittenberg reform. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to just dive in right quick, and we're going to go to this letter, y'all. It said, on, on May 31st, 1534, Philip Melanchthon, y'all, wrote a letter to his friend. It was Philip Melanchthon who wrote this letter, y'all. And he wrote it to his friend. <laughs> and it's a letter about him and Martin Luther, the two reformers. He wrote it to his friend, the lawyer, the Wittenberg lawyer, Benedict Pauli, in order to inform him about the unexpected event that occurred earlier that day, y'all. According to Melanchthon, an, an Ethiopian monk came to Wittenberg. This is Wittenberg, Germany, y'all. You got to understand, this is in 1534. I know this is a teaching message, but keep your head up with me, please. <laughs> this thing going to bless you. This was a meeting, y'all, way in Wittenberg, Germany. God, in the name of Jesus. And you got this Ethiopian coming way from Africa. It amazed this man, with, uh, Melanchthon. It's going to amaze him. We're going to see that. He said, how this Ethiopian traveling all the way from, from Africa in 1534. We're going to show you the power that your people had. <laughs> We're going to show you the wealth that your people possess, y'all. And if our people had it before, we could have it again. <laughs> if our people ruled before, we could rule again, y'all. You're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. That's his heart unto you, Israel. That's his heart unto you. And you teach that to your children. <laughs> you teach that to them so they can walk in confidence, man. You know what I'm saying? Look what Melanchthon said. He says, despite the, the initial communication difficulties, Melanchthon had to invite one of the fellow scholars as an interpreter. Michael and Luther were able to speak about the doctrines of the Trinity, the doctrines of the Godhead, y'all. You want to know where they got the... <laughs> Where they got their theology from? They discussing the Godhead. You know how complex that, that, that theological frame is? The Godhead? Ooh. We don't even fully understand the Godhead. In day in 1534, Tedrick, they breaking down the Godhead. <laughs> they breaking down the Trinity, man. You know what I'm saying? And he said the African guest proved himself. Michael the deacon, he proved himself, yo. What he proved himself? He proved himself to be homo energetic, um, genics, genesis, whatever that is. But I looked up the definition. It means to be in harmony, to be of the same mind, of the same state, yo. To be in agreement. You know what I'm saying? As they dialoguing and discussing even the Godhead. Man, you know how many Christians bump head on the Godhead? You know how many churches fall out on the Godhead? <laughs> this man coming way from Africa, way from Ethiopia. And he sit down and have a theological conversation with Martin Luther. And they of the same mind. They of the same spirit. <laughs> 
Martin Luther what? Out of Catholicism. Out of false worship, y'all. Ooh, pulling him out of that. He said, but who was? It, 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 it shocked him. He said, but who was this Ethiopian monk? And how did he come to Wittenberg? He said, by the turn of the 16th century, y'all, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians were by no mean rare guesses. Ooh, they weren't rare, meaning that they've been traveling. <laughs> oh, let's go there. <laughs> you people been traveling, man. They try to keep us from Africa. I was telling that to my wife today. And I'm going to go into prophetic. We're going to get into the scripture. But you see our bishop? Who? God. And us as a people, our movement, we're going to connect with our people overseas like no other. <laughs> Boo, he going to bring us together, y'all. Together. And Jacob going to rule again. <laughs> Jacob going to rule again. You see, Esau and Jacob can't rule at the same time. Oh, God. And the Bible said when the wicked rule it, the people mourn. Ain't the people mourning right now under this wicked rulership of Esau? These fake Jews who's dominating everything? But he said, Jacob... <laughs> <laughs> in the book of Barak. He said, he said, but the beginning going to follow who? Jacob. It's going to start with Jacob. Jacob going to rule again. He going to rule again, y'all. Look what he says. He says, there was no, no rare guesses in the Latin West. Man, them ball was moving around. As supposed subjects of the legendary Ethiopian Orthodox monk in the crater of the Reformation. Ooh, we're just reading it again. But let me read it. It says, as supposed subjects of the legendary, a man called Prester John. You see it in that? Where is that? Prester John, yo. Prester John. Keep going, sound boot. Yeah, he in that. Prester John. What he is? A minor who was believed to rule over a powerful Christian empire in the midst, that miss mean in the middle of Muslims and pagans. <laughs> oh, we're going to get into this Preston John right quick. Now pull up that, that picture from me, sound boot. It's a, it's a map that was put together by the, by the um, pork, um, the pork, pork, Portuguese, you know what I'm saying, as they colonized Africa. Look at that. Look at that. That's their map, y'all. You know what I'm saying? I wish he could have he could have go closer. But I want to get. <laughs> but you see that man sitting in that chair? That's a black man in his Ethiopian mare, ma mar, you know what I'm saying? But he's sitting in that chair right there. He was a he was an Ethiopian king, y'all who was legendary, who was legendary. He was legendary. You know what I'm saying? And his name was Presta John. Now I got to go into some other stuff right quick. Y'all stay right there. Keep that right at the um, sound boot, please. <laughs> In Jesus' name. I'm going to read you a little bit about Presta John right quick. Presta John, let's give you, let's give you some, 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 some facts about him. Because the Gentiles, they want to write him out. They want to write him out. They whitewash everything. I never heard of a Presta John. I never heard of a legendary king who ruled. <laughs> who these Gentiles were scared of, yo? Because when you continue reading it, we're going to see it. It says that he had respect. In the midst of the, the Muslims and the pagans. Presta John, a Christian. Who a Christian. And I would go far to say a Christian Hebrew who reigned over Ethiopia. Who reigned over Ethiopia. Look what it says, and you can look it up for yourself, because they try to make it as a fable. But we're going to see that it's written in all their writings. 
They got over 100 manuscripts of Prester John, but they say he a fable. <laughs> in their libraries in Europe. It's in their libraries today, but yet they say he a fable, um, Dr. Tuck. They say he a fable, a fable. But he, he got 100 manuscripts written in Europe? Come on, man. Who you learn to? Look what it said, a legend of Prester John. That's, that's who gave this, this Ethiopian monk the freedom to move about how he did. They was in Cairo, y'all. They was all the way in, in um, not, not, not see, not, um, not see you all the way, all the, put it like this, all the Mediterranean area, they was wrong. All the way to Jerusalem. And we're going to look at the times they was doing it. They weren't doing it in no easy times, no. They was doing it in the time of the, of the diasporic time. Ooh, the ball was moving into different diasporic countries, but yet not being touched. <laughs> and that's the word I got for my Hebrew brothers, because a lot of our people ran into Africa, and they settled in West Africa. And they started a civilization. They started... Timbuktu, they started the, the kingdom of Judah by Bernie. By Bernie, you know what I'm saying? And we're going to get into it, but Bernie was the same kingdom, the Dohemi kingdom, who, who the Europeans used, <laughs> who he gave the fire sticks to, to put our people in bondage. But they ran into to West Africa and started a community. You know about it. We preach it all the time. They say all the time when they connect us, how we got into the slave trade, the diaspora in the first place. Where the curses kicked in. <laughs> because he said no matter how far you go, he said, he said these curses going to kick in if you don't do what I'm telling you. If you don't come to me and submit, and we wrapping up, what I got, Shane? Time. We're going to wrap it up and on. Um, but Christian Hebrew, people like Matthew, they settled in Ethiopia. And we hear about a king who's legendary. Not just any kind of king, but a Christian. He got a Christian empire, y'all. Who, who cutting it straight? who walking this thing out by the grace of the Most High, who had to receive, receive the gospel, receive Yahshua, Hamashiach, y'all. And God kept it. <laughs> I believe he wanted to show our Hebrew people because we had some who were Hebrew Christians, and we got that today. Newsflash. That's, that's, the, that's where we find ourselves as a people at today. You see, the gospel had to go to the Gentiles, but, but we got these, these Hebrew Christians who fled, I believe, into Africa. And the other ones went into West Africa and started their own community. But what God did, just like we did in America, started the Wall Street, started all these different things. And the, the Greenvilles and all of that, what I turned into God. <laughs> what I given our heart to God and what happened? The same thing that happened to them in West Africa. They come through and tear it all down and bring them into the diaspora. Bring them and put them on ships like God said he won. He said, I don't care what you build. He said, I'm going to tear it down. He said, unless you turn to me, that's the only way you're going to have peace. That's the only way you're going to have peace, Judah. That's the only way you're going to have peace, Hebrews. You could build what you want. Money is not our problem. We're not turning to our God, man. And God kept a whole nation in Ethiopia where his people was. Why? Because they had turned to Christ. Ooh, and they was balling. They was on. The king had treasury. When we, man, when you go and read that, because I don't know if I'm going to get back to it, because I might just keep going because we got to get into prayer. But the Holy Spirit be pulling me, and I'm like, God, why you want me to bring this? Why, God? Why? He said, because my people need to know. 
I want to bless them and I will bless them. But I, not without them getting right with me. Because I would be blessing them for nothing. I'm going to be blessing them for nothing. Why? Because the curses of Deuteronomy are going to kick in. My word cannot lie. God watches over his word to perform it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, they raise up Timbuktu. They raise up all kind of library, all the books in the world. But what happened to it? They am tumbling down. While the Hebrews who received Jesus was in Ethiopia untouched. No colonizing. You know what I'm saying? Doing good. Now I know the state they're in right now because the gospel had to go to the Gentile. The riches had to go to the Gentile. But I believe God wanted to show his people. Pull up Malachi for me. He wanted to make a difference. A difference. Pull up Malachi. He wanted to make a difference, y'all. A difference. You know the scripture in Malachi. Where is that, Lord? I gave it to your wife. Malachi 3. Chapter 16 through 18, God gave a word. He heard two believers speaking, y'all. Let's bring this to us. Let's close this thing. Let's wrap this thing up and give this word to our people. Let's wrap this thing up. It's time for us to grow, y'all. He tired of his people doing the same thing. He tired of his people just going to church and clapping and dancing and all that. He tired of that. It's not time for that. It's time for us to go up like Bizzle say, oh God. And he putting people in the midst of Israel, y'all, to bring them all the way up. <laughs> but will you listen, Israel? Will you humble yourself? Will you receive from his prophets that he's sending? Israel, hear me. Oh God, he's calling them to, to even shine light upon the man of God. Ministers that don't know nothing about him. He waking them up in dreams talking about the man of God. Ooh. You could be in the midst of a prophet and know it not. And know it not. And know it not. God got a blessing for you. He ready to take you all the way up. <laughs> He ready to make a difference because we standing in that place where they got the Hebrew Christians who follow, who the Hebrew Christians who 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 locking on with us. But we got them that straddling in the fence, want to follow the Torah, want to follow the law. The end of the law is in Christ. The law don't do nothing but produce death. The letter kill it, but it's the spirit that give it life. Yeah, you got a minute truth. You got a little truth of who we are. But you're missing the greater truth. God told us the worship that he desires. He said, them that worship me, go worship me in spirit and in truth together. Not just truth. But then we got the church plan. Not just spirit. Not just jumping around, not just speaking in tongues, not just spirit, not just truth, but spirit and truth. Spirit and, and truth. And I ain't had time to go into it, but Malachi, he talked about the difference that he would make between the Christian, between those that was with him and those that's not. <laughs> God. God in the name of Jesus. And he gave us a promise. And I'm going to read it to you in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 through 12. He gave us a promise, y'all. We didn't watch that promise come to pass in the Gentiles. If I had time, I'd have taken you to Luke. He said he would, he would, that Jerusalem would be trampled down by the Gentiles until the time be fulfilled. 
till the time be fulfilled. In the book of, of, of Sucking Ezra's, I taught you about it. And we're going to wrap it up. Y'all bear with me. You know what I'm saying? Sucking Ezra's, he talked about that he would be, he would be, ooh, visiting the earth. And he said at that same time, he said it would be the fulfillment of the affliction. They got a fulfillment for the Gentiles, but a fulfillment of the affliction of Judah, of my people. And we in that space where the fulfillment is being fulfilled with the Gentile and where the fulfillment is being fulfilled with his people. The affliction is ceasing, y'all. They can't hold you like they once did. The doors are open to you. The, the song that I played, this is what's on your life. This is what's on your life for your jobs. This is what's on your life for your children. This is what's on your life for all the things that you desire and want. Yes and amen. <laughs> yes and amen, y'all. That's what heaven's saying over you right now. Yes and amen. I know you think you can't get the job, but look, yes and amen. I know the devil fighting you in the spirit, but look, yes and amen. <laughs> I know it don't look like your child going to get saved and come to the Lord, but look, yes and amen. I know it look like that marriage is not going to work, but yes and amen unto you. Receive it. Receive it. Receive this rain of word. Because God said, and we're going to close out in Isaiah. <clears throat> he said in the day, verse 10, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. Oh, God, a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner for the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him. And he and his rest, resting place, shall be glory. We didn't watch the Gentiles seek him, y'all. And he didn't bless the Gentiles. He said, I'm going to bless the Gentiles so much that I want to cause my people to jealousy. He said, I'm going to bless them with the gospel, but I'm going to also bless them with monetary wealth because it comes with it. This ain't no, this ain't no, no, no prosperity preaching. Nah, wherever the gospel go, blessings go. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. Ooh. Not for us to flaunt, not for us to, 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 to shine, not for us to do all these different things that's in our own mind. But it's to stand as a testimony for them that's broken, for them that's lost. So you could say, just like God came through as when I received this gospel and he blessed me. If you receive that gospel, he going to bless you too. He going to bless you too. He going to bless you too. He said in 11, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time. Y'all. He did it already the first time with the Gentiles. He said, I'm going to do it a second time to recover the remnant. <laughs> Keep going. To recover the remnant of his people, y'all. Of his people who are left from, from, from Assyria to in Egypt, all the way to Egypt. From Petros all the way to Cush to Ethiopia, y'all. From Elam to Shinar. From Hamat to the islands of the seas, yo. He will set a banner for the nation and will assemble the outcasts of Israel <laughs> and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. You've been scattered. You've been scattered. And then he go deep. He said, I'm going to bring Ephraim and Judah together. Judah, Ephraim not going to be jealous of Judah. And Judah not going to harass Ephraim. He said, I'm going to gather them. Who, God? 
We see in the first fruits of that gathering now. We've seen it. God is making an alarm. He's making a clarion call. He's doing all that he got to do to push it through the internet, through YouTube, through word of mouth. Oh, God. Until he gather his people. I sent a scripture to Kevin. The Bible said, bless is the nation who, who God is the Lord, man. His people, his who is his, his, his inheritance? You all is inherit. So, man, we're going to close right in. I thank you for standing there with me with truth. God is doing a new thing. And he want to give us truth in these days. He want to give us truth. But there ain't no truth like the truth of the gospel. It's the most important truth that God ever sent. And he sent it in a man. He sent it in the flesh, y'all. The God man. Who came to live a life that we couldn't live. Who came and died the death that we were supposed to die. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We none perfect. No, not one, y'all. He came and laid his life down for us. He said, no man take it my life. I lay it down willingly. And he say, all that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not that you might be saved. You will be saved. Ooh, woo. So we're going to open the altar. And if you heard the Lord in any way in this message, you know what I'm saying? Come and deal with your God. If you want to receive this gospel truth, come and deal with your God. And if the Lord spoke to you in any other fashion, who come and deal with your God? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Who he didn't use this little man? Who he didn't raise out the hood? Who he didn't raise y'all? From the crumbs of the earth, selling dope, doing all kind of wickedness, y'all. Who never was supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be in the line with the preachers. I'm not supposed to be in the line with the theologians. I'm not supposed to be in the line, God. Even in Dallas, y'all. You know how many great men that came out of Dallas, y'all. I'm not supposed to be in that line. And if God did it for me, he could do it for you. We serve an awesome God, a God who moves heaven and earth for you. Oh, God. So we're going to pray, y'all. We're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. We're asking you to set free and break bondages. So y'all repeat after me. Say, Father. I thank you for truth. I thank you for eyes, eyes being open. I thank you for being the God who never leaves things hidden. But Lord, we thank you for your truth, your truth of the gospel. And we asking you to fill us up with your spirit make us new save us Lord we believe in the death in the burial and in the resurrection of your dear son so fill us up with your spirit make us new for your glory in Jesus name in Jesus name Father, I thank you for your people, God. I'm asking you, God, to show forth your strength, God, and save them. Like we talked about last week, God, save not only them, but save their whole families, God. That's the promise you gave in the scripture. So I'm asking you, God, to, 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 to do what you have said. I'm asking you, God, to open doors for them. I'm asking you, God, to increase them in every area you got. Let yes and amen rest upon them, God. Wherever they go, 
Show forth your word. Confirm your word tonight, God. Bless your people indeed, God. Bless them a lot, Father. Let them not lack anything. Cause, God, them to be sufficient in all things, God, according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Give them grace for grace, God. Cause all grace to abound towards. And we thank you for it. I ask that you heal some, God. I ask that you remove, God, heartache and pain, God. I ask you to heal, God, for the Lord, mental problems, God. I, I ask you to heal battles for the Lord that they're going through within their own members, God. I ask you to heal for the Lord, cancer, God, neck problems, God. Anything, God, that's hindering your people, God. I'm asking you to do it even now, God, under the sound of my voice, God. For well, it's not I that speak it, but you, O King. It's you that live it in me. So bless your people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless Israel. Bless Israel. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord bless you with shalom and peace. Cedric. Love you, my brother. Love you, my brother. On the way Woo. out. On the way out. God. Don't forget.